uh, musicians and uh, engineers and producers, and some techies and some nerds and some roadies and toadies and hangers on and songwriters, wannabes. Did I get everyone, y'all? I don't think so. But I'm here. And I'm very glad to be here. I'll tell you what. And I'm going to tell you some things about where I've been, what I've done, and not my private life, I promise you. Uh, but firstly, I've got to thank some folks. Uh, this gentleman named James Young. There he is, stand up. Take a, take a bow. From Sonic Distribution. Whee! Uh, strong room. Quinn Simone. Al. Yay, all these guys. Yay. They did a great job. Thank you very much. Yes, it was quite a treat putting this all in this room. I don't know if this room has actually ever been this packed. Have you ever seen it this packed? Who knows this room? Who's been in here before? Has there ever been this much? No. No? Good. So we can keep on drinking and having a party. But uh, a little bit about where I came from, which was Cape Town, South Africa. And if there are any South Africans in here, go home. <laughs> right, and I'll start speaking very much like this, you see. Um, I was very fortunate I had a terrific musical education. Uh, my mom and dad were into the arts a bit, and uh, my dad actually played the fiddle. And um, I learned classical piano at a very early age. And then, at night, what did I do? I was tuning in to the little shortwave radio. Now, shortwave radio was all I had because there was no bloody TV in South Africa when I grew up. But that was cool because I listened to BBC, Overseas Service, and The Voice of America. Now, Voice of America, now that was something else because that's really where I got to hear all the cool early rock stuff. Um, little Richard drove me insane. I had to try to figure out how the hell did he play piano like that. It was just so percussive and amazing. Um, Elvis Presley and just a, a host of fantastic music that was coming out of the Voice of America. And um, the thing that probably stuck in my brain, I didn't realize it subconsciously, was the sound of shortwave radio tuning in. You know that Was that not the first leg of phasing? It must have been. Anyway, um, around about 1960, I immigrated to the UK. Yay. My mom's English, born and bred, Cockney, born and bred. Yay! And um, I sort of found my way into the recording business. Um, very lucky to be in England in the early 60s. The you know, Beatles hadn't quite come out yet, but they were about to. And um, I think I was in the right place at the right time. <laughs> And just imagine seeing the Beatles on TV for the first time. Wow, that was like, who are those guys? <laughs> what are they doing? You know. Um, I figured out how to get into the studio business. Anybody know of a, a studio in London called AdVision? Yeah. Anybody yeah. hear it? Yeah. Well, it was at 83 New Bond Street. That's where I started. Um, it was uh, kind of a fun time because there was no such thing as multi-track when we were starting to record. Mono! Mono only! And you really had to have your act together to be able to record mono, and I still feel that. Ended up after AdVision, um, through Pi Studios, which was in Great Company Place, ATV House. Anybody remember where that place was? Anybody yeah. know where that is? Yeah. Good. Um, a lot of great stuff happened there. Sammy Davis, The Kinks. Uh, and I was working with a, a very, who's ever heard of a very famous English engineer? To me, the most brilliant English engineer, British engineer, Bob Auger. Anybody ever hear of him? I used to work for him. Lovely. Where is he? He's buried, isn't he? Yeah, I'm afraid he's dead, yeah. Yeah, sorry about that. Box job, right? I'm afraid so. Nobody gets that joke. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody yeah. said that to me about Hendrix, and I went, yeah, right. <laughs> Bob Auger was amazing. He was probably the most influential on in my life in terms of what we did. We would go one day with the Pi Mobile, which was three track in those days, three track half inch, right? Go to Walthamstow Town Hall, three U47s, and record the whole 90 piece symphony orchestra. Next day, we'd be at Pi doing the kinks. Da da, da da, da da, you know, 
know, all that stuff, right? And who played guitar on that? Anybody? Who? Mr. Mr. Who? <laughs> Mr. Page! Yes, Mr. James Page. <coughs> Soon after that, I was invited to go to um, work for Olympic. Now, as you all know, Olympic was an independent studio that was not tied to any of the major labels. It's all the major labels, of course, Pi, Decca, Philips, of course, EMI, Abbey Road. They were the independent. They were the, the major label ones where the, the artists were kind of forced to go and record there. But Olympic was cool. It was edgy. Plus, it had a brilliant console uh, when we opened up in Barnes called Helios. Dick Swetman. Anybody here? Dick Swetman. Young person. Oh, yep. that's good. But that studio, because it was independent and edgy and had cool consoles and a very, very um, different sort of attitude, it wasn't stuffy, became the, the haven, the sort of center for all of rock gentry. From January of 67, the beginning when we opened, we had Jimi Hendrix, of course, The Stones, uh, Traffic, and The Beatles, which was very unusual. It was an amazing time, actually, to be an engineer, learning the craft, because, cheers, mate, um, there were no schools in those days. There wasn't an SAE or a Full Sail or, I don't know what the cool schools here in England are. Any names of any schools here? Are there Point any? Blank. Do what? Point Blank. Point Blank. I'm not sure what that is, oh, but I'm no. sure it has some meaning. But um, this was learning from the school of hard knocks. You got kicked in the ass if you didn't do it right or you got fired, or both. Um, and of course I was the ubiquitous T-boy, you know, stag staggering around the studio, and if, if there are any T-boys around here, you know what I mean, you know, stagger around with the big tray. I love you, want more sugar in that. <laughs> <laughs> and then of course you had to clean the toilets. We all know about that. Um, by the end of 67, I was asked by the record plant in New York to come over to the States because Jimmy was moving from London to New York to continue working and living. And uh, I thought about it for about 30 seconds and said, yeah, that was it. And so I arrived there in 68 and I continued working with him. I, during 67, we did a couple of albums you may have heard of. One was I Experience and that was Axis. Was that? Anybody know those records? Yeah. 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 Oh, okay. Well, had me worried for a minute. Um, amazing to work with a, a, you know, probably the world's greatest guitar player. But here we are in, in New York in 68, and we're starting on Electric Ladyland. What's not known is the fact that Electric Ladyland started in England as a four-track. In fact, um, Crosstown Traffic and all along the Watchtower were four-track masters originally, and then transferred over to 12 track, one inch. I missed eight track completely. <laughs> so there you are. Working in, in New York City was also a fantastic experience because it's a totally different culture. You know, the consoles are completely different. They had multi-tracks up the yin-yang and I was like, wow, look at all these tracks. And Hendrix went, whoa, man, 12 tracks. Do you do this? Fill them all up. And we did. And then, of course, we threw out that 12-track one-inch machine, which was a scully piece of crap. It sounded so noisy. And um, <clears throat> we transferred all of that stuff to 16-track. So all along the watchtower, started as a 4, went 4, 12, 16. So, and it still sounded quite good. So we must have done something right. I don't know what. And after that, um, 69, of course, was the next year of fun and games. Um, there was a concert upstate New York called Woodstock. I managed to have a little hand in that. Three days of drugs and hell, man. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean it. 